First, London Business School professor Alex Edmonds will give a talk titled, Grow the Pie. Please welcome Professor Alex Edmonds. Thank you very much. It's a huge pleasure to be here and to be involved in this award trying to solve some of the biggest problems facing society and the planet. So what I'm going to speak about is the power of purpose in encouraging innovation, not just to serve wider society, but also to be good for business. So my job is a professor of finance. And so finance is about creating shareholder value, making money, serving profits. And so we often think that this is at the expense of wider society. But what I like to highlight is by having a sense of purpose, companies can deliver both profits for shareholders, but also value for wider society. So how can that be? So let me start with an example. So I'm going to take us back to 2003. And Vodafone, which is the UK telecoms company, they noticed that in Kenya, Kenyan citizens were using their phones to transfer mobile minutes to each other as a form of currency. And this gave them an idea. What if we could develop a technology that would allow people to transfer not mobile minutes, but actual cash? Because at the time, 15 million Kenyan adults were unbanked. They had to rely on cash, which could be forged or lost or stolen. So if they could pull it off, the social impact would be huge. And indeed, four years later, Vodafone launched m which is a mobile money service that allowed people to transfer money from phone to phone just as easily as we could send a text message or send a photo today. And this completely transformed citizens' lives. So within the first seven years, it lifted 200,000 households out of poverty and many of these households were headed up by women because it allowed them to move from agriculture to business and retail, so there was a large effect on gender equality. But also, interestingly, this was something that later led to profit for Vodafone. Because even though they generally started this idea to solve a social problem of financial inclusion in Kenya, Ultimately, they were able to monetize it and turn it into a profit. Why? Because if you create value for society, ultimately somebody will be willing to pay you for this. So why am I starting my talk with this example? It's to get us to ask the following two questions. So the first question is how much value did voted m create for wider society? And the second question is, if Vodafone did not launch m what would have been the damage to its ESG rating or reputation? I'm not going to poll anybody, because I'm sure people would agree with the answer. So for the first question, how much value did m create for wider society? A huge amount of value. It lifted 200,000 households out of poverty, and it contributed to gender equality. But if I turn to the second question, what would have been the public outrage if Vodafone had not launched m -Pesa? It would have been nothing. Right? There would have been no media boy backlash. There would have been no customer boycott. Nobody would have ever put Vodafone in trouble because nobody would have even thought it was possible to launch this crazy idea of banking without a bank. And so this is my view of purpose. Often we think, well, what does it mean to be a responsible business? We want to answer that second question. We don't want to get involved in a scandal. We want to avoid an environmental disaster. We want to avoid mistreating our workers. We want to avoid underpaying our taxes. We often think, what is it to be a responsible business in 2023? We do no harm. We don't harm the planet. We don't harm people. But I'm saying that this is not enough. Right? It is not enough for a company to say, I am doing no harm to society. Instead, companies need to answer the first question and to actively do good. 
And so this is why, for me, it's a huge pleasure to be involved in this competition because these are innovations which are actively creating value for society. Nobody was forcing the four finalists to come up with these ideas. They didn't need to do this to avoid a scandal or a media backlash. They instead did this in order to create value and positively impact our world. And so why do I think this is the correct way to think about purpose and responsibility today? It is because of the theme of growing the pie, which is the theme of the talk. So what is the pie? Well, we can think about the pie as the value that a company creates, and we can divide this between profits to investors, that's the blue, and value to wider society, that's the orange. And that could be something like fair wages, fair taxes, and fair prices. And we often think, well, what does it mean to be a responsible business? It means we split the pie more fairly. We pay workers more than we need to, we charge customers lower prices than we can get away with, and we might pay more taxes than the bare minimum. And absolutely, right, part of responsibility is a fair split of the pie. But I would argue that that is not enough. It is not enough for a company to think about re responsibility as redistribution. Why? Because if purpose involves splitting the pie differently, then many CEOs won't want to do it. Right? Why would I want to do something that makes my company less profitable? And we have this big problem of greenwashing. Right? Companies claim I'm going to serve wider society, but they don't put it into practice. And why would they? If purpose means my company will be less profitable, then let me just say some nice statements and never actually deliver. So this is why my view of responsible business is it's about growing the pie. Well, absolutely we do want to increase the orange, but the way we do this is not by giving a greater slice of what's already there, but through innovation, through excellence, through coming up with some crazy ideas like banking without a bank, that's what Vodafone did. Why? Because the beauty of this is even though that those innovations were driven by the desire to serve society to increase the orange, by growing the pie, ultimately, the blue increases as well and companies also become profitable. So what this is about is can we find ways through innovation of solving social challenges but in ways which also fulfill one of the primary purposes of business, which is to deliver returns to investors. Now you might think, well, if I'm defining purpose and responsibility as innovation, well, do we need a purpose to do this? Right? Shouldn't any company want to be innovative? Isn't it enough to think about making money? Because if we want to make money, will that not drive us to innovate? So you might think, well, why do companies come up with electric cars? Well, even if you did not have a concern for the environment, you might still come up with electric cars. Why? Because you could just look at the economics of the car industry. You will know that there is profit to be made out of moving from traditional to electric cars. So you don't need a special purpose to do that. However, there are many innovations which you might not be able to justify with purely a financial calculation. If you go back to the idea of M-Pesa, right, what was the profit calculation from launching that? It would have been hugely negative. Right, the likelihood of being able to develop this technology was really low. Even if you did develop it, would you be able to make money from it serving some of the poorest people in the world in Kenya? Indeed, Vodafone had a strategy back then, and their strategy was to expand in the West and to win Spectrum license auctions because there was far more money to be made in the West. But Vodafone had a purpose, and this purpose was to build a digital society that enhances socioeconomic progress. And that's what inspired them to launch the idea of m even though it could have never been justified with a financial calculation. So the power of purpose is if we start with innovation, driven by the desire to serve society, to solve problems of people and planet, could that lead us to innovate in ways that we would not do otherwise if we just thought about traditional market analysis where the profit opportunities were? Now, at this point in my talk, 
eight minutes in, you might think, well, everything I say sounds great, but where is the evidence? What I seem to be saying of companies that are driven by the idea to serve society, magically the pie will grow and investors will be better off. But that seems almost too good to be true. So this is why my day job as a professor is not to tell stories. Right? I've told one story of Vodafone which worked, but how do you know that I didn't just hand pick this one story because it supports my viewpoint? Instead, as a professor, we look at large-scale evidence across hundreds of companies over many, many industries. And what I wanted to look at is, are companies driven by the desire to serve society, are they going to be more profitable in the long term? So this is one of my own studies, which I completed a while ago. Does purpose pay off? Well, how do I measure which companies were delivering value to wider society? Well, what I wanted to look at was the 100 best companies to work for in America. How do companies do in terms of treating their employees? Now, you might think, well, why is that my measure of purpose? That seems really uninspiring compared to some of the solutions we've seen to plastics, to, um, the, to help the blind, to um, desalination. But it's quite difficult to compare, say, a desalination technology towards a biodegradable plastic versus a braille device, whereas employees, this is something which is comparable across every single company. And also, you might think, well, why don't I look at climate? That's really important. But climate is important if you're in energy. It's not so important if you're, say, a social media company. So I'm looking at employees because this is material for every single company out there. And importantly, I don't have a measure of did you avoid a scandal? Did you avoid a strike or labor unrest? Remember, my definition of purpose was not doing no harm. It was actively doing good. Can we go above and beyond in this case and how you treat your employees? So this measure I have is the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America. These are companies which are top of the tree in how they provided a great place to work. And to cut a long story short, I wanted to see do these companies actually outperform, or are they just fluffy companies who are distracted from the bottom line? And what I found was that the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered shareholder returns that beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28-year period. That is 89 to 184% compound. And so the companies that were treating their employees well, they weren't just splitting the pie, giving up some of the pie to the employees. They were growing the pie. Employees were becoming more productive, more innovative, and more likely to stay. And you might think, well, that sounds great, but how do we know, is it correlation or is it causation? I seem to be claiming that if you treat your work as well, your company will do better, but maybe it's the opposite. Maybe once the company is already doing well, then employees are happy because they're able to spend more on wages. Or maybe if you're in, say, the tech industry, in the tech industry, employees are happy because there's a lot of innovation and it's a fun place to work. And if you're in the tech industry, um, you are also performing well because this has been a successful sector. So what I had to do was to rule all of this out and to suggest that if you first start by how can we create a great place to work, that will ultimately lead to profits down the line. So in the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about putting purpose into practice. So my first part is what does it mean to be responsible, not to do no harm, to actively do good. The second part is this does lead to performance in terms of bottom line profits. My third and final part, the most important, is well, how do we actually become more purposeful as a company? Now, again, I'm going to start by having a little bit of a different view to what we typically hear. Often people define purpose as trying to serve everybody. You see companies with purpose statements like this one. Our purpose is to serve customers, workers, suppliers, the environment, and communities, and investors. Now, that sounds great, but it's unrealistic because you can't serve everybody. Right, so if you are an energy company and you close down a polluting plant, that's good for the environment, but it's bad for workers. And if you think about the word purpose in the English language, 
it doesn't mean serving everybody. It means being focused and targeted. If I do something on purpose, I do it deliberately. If I have a purposeful meeting, it's one with a clear agenda. So how I define purpose is why a company exists, who it serves, its reason for being, and the role that it plays in the world. And that might seem quite lofty and idealistic, but to pick it apart, what I'm trying to emphasize here is we can't try to solve every single problem in the world, but to look at a couple of things, like why you exist, it can't be to solve all the world's problems, but to think about a couple. Like we often look at the sustainable development goals, there's 17 of them, but it's not a company's responsibility to solve all 17 goals, but maybe to focus on the three or four where you can really move the needle. So if there's only one thing that you take away from my talk, it is this. How do we decide which of these goals to address? To ask yourself the question, what is in my hand? By this I mean, what are the resources, what is the expertise that my company has, and how can I use this to serve society if I think a little bit more creatively? So for Vodafone, what was in their hand was a technology that at the time was able to transfer text messages, and instead they tried to use this to instead transfer mobile money. And notice that this is a quite different way of thinking about purpose to how most companies think about it, which is rather than using what's in a hand, we instead react to what's out there. So when George Floyd gets killed, a lot of companies uh, give money to Black Lives Matter. I am clearly somebody who cares a lot about racial equality. But if you're a company like Vodafone, maybe your expertise is not knowing whether a racial equality charity is better than a cancer charity or better than an environmental challenge charity. It is using your technology to have innovative applications such as M-Pesa. So let me end with just three ways of how companies can use what is in their hand. Well, the first is to do new things. And this is typically what people think about when they think about innovation, obviously. Right? Any company will try to innovate, even if you're a company without a purpose, you, but you will innovate only if you see a bottom line profit, something monetizable at the end of doing so. However, there's many other companies driven by purpose where you will innovate to serve wider society, to solve a social problem, and that will push us towards doing more innovations than what we might do otherwise. That might be towards serving new products and services for existing clients, or trying to reach new clients to begin with who we might have never reached before. That is the idea of Vodafone moving away from their traditional heart to somewhere like Kenya. And then how do I apply this myself as a business school professor? Well, my existing clients are my MBA students at London Business School. My job is to teach them corporate finance. But really, will their lives change because I teach them to do the weighted average cost of capital? Probably that will not be life-changing. But one of the more important skills in the business world today is public speaking. So for me, I give a large public speaking element to my corporate finance class. And also, yes, it's a privilege for me to teach London Business School students, but many of the people who most require financial tools, well, they can't afford to do an MBA at London Business School because it costs $100,000. However, I have another position with Gresham College, which is an organization which gives free lectures to the public, just like Michael Faraday used to give on science, and that is a way of reaching new people. So this is for me, as just one person, how can I think about things beyond my day job of teaching finance to business school students? Obviously, the power of companies with far more resources, there's many analogies, I'm sure, within LG. But the second thing is to do the same thing, but in a different way. So, even if we just don't change what we actually do, 
just by pursuing this with a huge amount of excellence, that is something which is really purposeful. And in particular for a company like LG, where the heart of what you do is already creating so much value for wider society, even if we don't think explicitly about purpose, just by being excellent in innovation, in design, in customer service, that has a huge effect on wider society. So again, to my analogy as me as a professor, what is the best way that I add value to society? It is not by the fact that I bike to lectures rather than taking a taxi. It is by preparing my classes to make sure they're not just theoretical, but they're also practical, just excellence in the core business, professional pride in what you do at LG. Maybe it's not in innovation, maybe you work in payroll, maybe you work in procurement. Just doing this is an excellent way has a huge impact on society. The final thing is to do the same thing in the same way, but to recognize the ultimate purpose of what you're doing. So I'm sure some of you will know this graphic. Three people are doing the same thing. One of them is building bricks, laying bricks. The other says, I'm making a living. And the third says, I'm building a cathedral. So they're doing exactly the same thing, but they are looking at, one of them is looking at the ultimate purpose of what they're doing, whereas the first person only looks at the small immediate action. And so again, with an LG, maybe this is uh, somebody who works on refrigerators, on the one hand, you might be designing a small problem. On the other hand, you might think, well, ultimately, by being able to do this, I am allowing people access to fresh food, and this is something which is going to transform their lives by giving them access to nutrition. And obviously, here, we have a lot of very senior people. And as a senior person, what you are able to ultimately do is, if you're customer facing, you are seeing the ultimate impact of a company's products. And sometimes junior people don't see this themselves, so one of the responsibilities that we might have, particularly the more senior ones who are customer facing, is to report the impact of all of the great things LG does internally. One of the banks I work with in the UK is NatWest. And NatWest, after the pandemic was over, the CEO, Alison Rose, she took out her senior management team to a restaurant in Covent Garden called the Darjeeling Express. And she had the restaurant owner tell the story. 30 years ago, she came to the UK. Nobody wanted to lend her. Why? Because she was an immigrant. She was somebody who had no experience. And she was a woman. And back then, it was even harder as a woman to get a loan than now. And she said, Nat West, by giving me this loan, I was able to hire this many people, create this many jobs, serve this many customers. And so this story got told just internally many, many times. And so if you were the person working on the loan to Asma Khan of the Darjeeling Express, you might think, I'm just doing some financial analysis. But this is something that ultimately created a huge amount of value. But often, as a junior person, we don't see the ultimate value that we create. And what about people who are sort of lower on in the organization? We're looking at here some amazing innovations like desalination, like biodegradable plastics, like, um, a, a, like Braille technology. But not everybody in an organization can do something that inspiring and that value creating. So what I'm going to end with is a much more humble, smaller idea of using what's in your hand. And this is an example from my first job at Morgan Stanley. I started off right at the bottom as a junior analyst. I thought I had nothing in my hand. Right? Nobody worked for me, I was right at the bottom. But in fact, I realized people did work for me. There was my secretary, there was my IT department, and there was perhaps the most abused department in an investment bank is graphics. You give them an um, unintelligible scribble, and they turn this into some PowerPoint slots. And often people would shout at graphics for not doing what you wanted, even though it was your fault because you were not explaining it clearly enough. So when I got good work back from graphics, I would call them up and say, hi, this is Alex. You worked on my job. I just wanted to say thank you. Right? You did all these things well. This other thing I never asked for, and you did it anyway. And honestly, I never did this to be seen as a nice person. I just was genuinely grateful. But because I was so junior, because I was right at the bottom, I didn't have my own office. I sat on the open plan floor. And so when people heard me, then they started to say thank you themselves. 
And so I'm not going to claim that we changed the entire culture of Morgan Stanley, but in just that floor of that office in London, people started to treat each other a little bit more kindly. So we often think of ourselves as a thermometer. We reflect the temperature around us. If the world is cutthroat, we need to cut throat, be cutthroaters to survive. But can we think of ourselves as a thermostat affecting the temperature around us with our own actions, even if we're somebody really junior, which I was, what was in my hand, it was something as simple as my own words and my ability to say thank you. And thank you is how I'm going to end because this has just been a great experience to be part of this great comp competition, to see companies growing the pie with all the innovations that they've made. Gamsa Hamnida, thank you very much.